It's great to see everyone here as we conclude part three of our fall launch. Regathering ourselves from summer's activities to refocus our attention to God's mission for this fall and into 2019. That was our leadership retreat's focus in June, and those leaders thought it would be beneficial to share with the rest of the congregation. In the last two weeks, we discovered how we got where we are and the new imaginations needed for navigation in the unknown world ahead of us. As an aid to orient you to this new space, we're providing a logbook of the presentation with spaces for notes and questions for later discussion, like this. For those needing a copy or a pen, please raise your hand and our deacons will provide one to you. Because we're a learning community, we're interested in your insights and questions. Please put questions on post-its where the ship is pictured for discussion at our ice cream social celebration. We're calling it Voyager Soundings and Bearings because soundings help us understand the depths we're in while bearings help us understand the direction we're going. Our first voyage in fall 2014 helped us enter the biblical imagination by painting the scriptural mural and discovering that story is our story. Our voyage continued in summer 2015 as we sailed toward a christening, discovering the different naming stories within scripture and leading to a new name for this church. That voyage continued in the fall as we discovered our three-part mission, our four cardinal directions or core values, and five true colors we have as crew on this vessel of grace, this ark of salvation. This fall's Voyager soundings and bearings continues that maritime merriment with a paddle wheel steamboat. Here's where today's journey will take us. We'll first ponder a timely task and revisit some summary questions of identity, vision, and mission. We'll look at how community was formed in the Bible in early church and how behavior, belief, and belonging have been reshuffled over time. We'll engage our third key question and get some help from scripture. As we round the last bend in the river of today's presentation, we'll consider community formation in our context. This is our ship's itinerary today. All aboard. Let's get underway. God has given the church a timely task for the present and future. Let's read this together. There is no more urgent task for our time than the rebuilding of community among our scattered families, anonymous neighborhoods, competitive workplaces, anti-social media, and partisan politics. The church, at its best, represents an international movement for wholeness whose shared and primary loyalty to Christ creates a united community despite the differences that might otherwise divide. We may recall from last week the challenges of true community, according to M. Scott Peck's books, A Different Drum. Such a true community is only possible after first passing through pseudo-community, chaos, and emptiness. These challenges bring us to our first logbook entry. Forming true community is nearly impossible. Only Christ's presence, power, and purpose make true cohesion possible. The challenge of forming true community can be met through Christ. Forming true community is a task 
woven throughout our denominational identity, vision, and mission statements. Consider, in the fragmented world on our doorsteps, how do we cultivate true community, welcome all, and move toward wholeness? How do we be and share the good news in our neighborhoods? How do we witness, love, and serve in our locale? If rebuilding and reforming true community is the urgent task for our time, where might we find resources to help us in that endeavor? One resource is scripture, where we find both bounded and centered set approaches to forming community. A bounded set example from the Hebrew scriptures is after the exiles returned from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. We're told in Nehemiah 13:3, when the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Israel drew a circle and placed those of foreign descent outside of it. A centered set example comes from Exodus 12, 37 to 38. The Israelites from Ramses to Succoth, a mixed crowd also went up with them. In addition to the Jewish descendants of Jacob, there were others from Egypt making their way to the promised land. Though outside of Israel, they had turned their faces toward the God of Israel and left Egypt as well. When we turn to the New Testament, we find the beginnings of true community amongst the 12 disciples. There were four fishermen, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. The latter two had explosive tempers, known as the Sons of Thunder. An anti-Nazarene, Nathaniel, Two fanatic Jewish nationalists, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, a despised tax collector, Matthew, a skeptic, Thomas, and even one with a Greek Gentile name, Philip. Twelve that shouldn't have gelled did because Jesus was at the center of their community. That community formation continued in the early church as recorded in Acts. The Holy Spirit pushed the boundaries of the church to include Jews of all nations, Hellenist, Greek-speaking Jews, proselytes, converts to Judaism, God-fearers, pagans partially converted to Judaism, royal Ethiopian eunuchs, Roman centurions, Pharisees, Athenians, Gentiles, slaves and free, male and female, rich and poor, barbarian and Scythian, etc., etc. That community formation continued beyond the pages of the New Testament as shared in Michael Green's book, Evangelism in the Early Church. The infectious enthusiasm on the part of such diverse people was backed up by the quality of their lives. Their love, joy, changed habits, and progressively transformed characters gave great weight to what they had to say. Their community life, though far from perfect, was nevertheless sufficiently different and impressive to attract notice, to invite curiosity, and to inspire discipleship in an age as pleasure conscious, as materialistic, and as devoid of purpose as our own. Paganism saw in early Christianity a quality of living and dying which could not be found elsewhere. When bishops were challenged for the proof of the gospel, for proof 
of Christianity's truth claims. They did not refer pagans to Scripture. An empty tomb, patches of burial cloth or pieces of the true cross, not to apostolic testimony of witnesses who were there, nor to warm, fuzzy feelings. They simply pointed to the local churches and said, see how every tribe, tongue, and nation who would otherwise be enemies of one another are gathered in love, peace, and fellowship, sharing one table, one faith, one baptism, and one Lord. There is your proof. The proof of truth was the community itself. See how they love one another, according to the Roman Pliny the Elder's letter. There was something so distinctive and positive about the early Christian community that pagans couldn't help but notice. Here's our second logbook entry. The earliest crew's camaraderie was so compelling that it was the proof of the gospel's truth. God has given the church the timely task of creating true community, a task the early church excelled in, and from which we can find relevant clues for the present and future. So how did the early church bring people into community? Alan Crider's book, The Change in Conversion and the Origin of Christendom, answers this question by showing how the relationship of behavior, belief, and belonging changed over time. For the earliest church, the first step of bringing someone into community was behavior. Christian behavior was so compelling and distinctive, it attracted pagans. Christians recognized the power and pull of the pagan imagination, and in order to instill a Christian imagination among pagans attracted to the faith, it would take three to five years of teaching to deprogram and reprogram their imagination. This wasn't done by lectures, but by assigning the Christian friend of the pagan to be their mentor and sponsor. The pagan would observe and imitate the behavior of their Christian sponsor, and through friendship and sponsorship, the prospect would act their way into a new way of thinking. Just as teaching someone how to fish is more powerful than giving them a fish, so too pagans were taught how to be Christian by example. Once their behavior was sufficiently Christian, they were then taken to the next level of community to be initiated into the mysteries, the beliefs, or the teachings of the faith. This was intensive daily teaching for weeks about orthodox beliefs, creeds, and the Lord's Prayer. With beha without behavior modification coming first, these teachings would be like throwing pearls before swine. They simply wouldn't be able to understand. After this intensive teaching period came the third step of bringing people into community, that of belonging. Candidates would be prepared for baptism, at which point they became full members, participating in community prayers, the kiss of peace, and communion. Their main task thenceforth was to live as Christians and through their behavior and friendship with other pagans continue the process. This is how Christians brought people into community for the first 300 years of the church. But all that changed with the Roman Emperor Constantine. Instead of persecuting Christians, Constantine set the stage for Christianity to become the official religion of the empire. This church-state synthesis reshuffled the order of how Christians brought people into community. 
Suddenly, to be a citizen of the empire was to automatically be a Christian. Everyone belonged. All infants were baptized, though only a few people attended church. Every citizen was taxed, and those monies were used to support the church. Mission was no longer amongst one's pagan neighbors. There weren't any anymore, but something done overseas. Those wishing to be confirmed in the church were instructed, but the teaching of beliefs shrunk to seven to 10 days and had minimal content. Heresy, a word which means choice, was banned, and state power enforced conformity to the state church. Behavior wasn't distinctive anymore, but simply conforming to social norms whose morals were legislated by the state. The New Testament ethic, living as the disciples and early church did, was no longer for every Christian. Instead, it was reserved for clergy and monks, not regular Christians, this was how Christians brought people into community for the next 1,100 years. But all that changed with the advent of modernity in the 1500s. With the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire, whether East or West, the church-state synthesis was shattered. Coupled with the Protestant Reformation, the dissemination of ideas through the Gutenberg press and the emergence of nation states as new political entities, the order for how Christians were brought into community was once again reshuffled. The Enlightenment's focus on rationality and ideas as of primary importance was reflected in the church. Christians brought people into community first by beliefs a set of intellectual propositions such as catechisms and confessions that varied by church. A true understanding of those beliefs would lead to a changed lifestyle, as in a different behavior. Once that behavior was observed to hold over a period of time, their changed lifestyle was proof that they were worthy to belong and to be accepted as a member of a Euro-tribal national church. This particular order for entering community believes that faith is more taught than caught and that people can come to faith, have a change of beliefs suddenly. This was how Christians brought people into community for the last 500 years. But all that changed with the emergence of the postmodern era in the last 30 to 40 years. 500 years. That phrase might ring some bells among us, reminding us of the turbulent times we're in, this perfect storm that's been brewing for 500 years. Given the epical postmodern change that's swirling around us, we might feel like those sailors with Paul on his way to Rome. Maybe we're buffeted by that violent wind, soaked by the raging tempest, and neither sun nor stars have appeared for many days. Perhaps we feel that all hope of being saved should be abandoned. Maybe that's why God sent an angel to Paul, telling him, don't be afraid. God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. If we remember that God is in the storm, sweeping away the old things to make way for the new, perhaps we can see this momentous change we're in as a, an opportunity. Postmodernity is reshuffling how Christians could bring people into community. Given our scattered families, anonymous neighborhoods, competitive workplaces, anti-social media, and partisan politics, God is offering the church an opportunity to be a movement for wholeness that helps create a united community in the postmodern era. There's a yearning in our culture for true community, for belonging, and being welcomed. As Christians, we can do that and build friendships with those around us. By indwelling the local space and re-entering our neighborhoods, we can induce changes in behavior, not only in our own behavior, but in others around us being re-socialized to a different narrative through their association with us. 
Some of those may come to participate in church life and by adopting Christian behaviors come to discover that they share our beliefs. It's a whole new landscape and riverscape before us, brought to us by the Lord of history and sovereign of the seas. This brings us to our third logbook entry. Over the millennia, the church has shuffled the order of how landlubbers are transformed into sailors. <coughs> Here's our third key question. How do we enter into, nurture, and create spaces of belonging with people whose space we share? In order to accomplish our timely task of rebuilding community, we have to re-enter the different communities we're already a part of, family, school, co-workers, neighbors, recreation, affinity groups, social clubs, trade associations, service organizations, and others. How might we come alongside these groups, be a friend, to have a friend, and enter into these already existing communities? How might we nurture these communities? How might we create spaces of belonging where there currently aren't any? These are significant questions for our time, questions whose answers can be found among the earliest Christians. Please read this passage from Luke 10, 1 through 12 with me. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. What are the implications of this passage for us today? Alan Roxburgh in his book, Missional, Joining God in the Neighborhood says, if you want to discover and discern what God is up to in the world just now, Stop trying to answer the question from within the walls of your churches. Like strangers in need of hospitality, who have left their baggage behind, enter the neighborhoods and communities where you live. Sit at the table of the other, and there you may begin to hear what God is doing. Please read with me these passages. Perhaps Luke is suggesting that a primary way of discerning God's plan is when, like the exiles, we re-enter the life of the local people, listen to their stories, and love them deeply without feeling the need to sell or make a pitch or assume we already know what they need and what the gospel ought to look like in this time and place. 
The real challenge we face is how to transform the imagination of our leaders for them to see. It's not about getting their churches filled. It's about joining with what God is doing in the world. How might we join with what God's doing in the world? What would putting Luke 10 into practice look like today? Here are some rules or practices we can adopt. It's only when we can imagine and believe that God is operating outside the church that we can, we can then behave differently with our neighbors. It's only with a new imagination that we can engage neighbors in new relationships. These rules help us act our way into a new way of thinking. First rule is to go local for it's in the ordinary lives of local church people that the Spirit is shaping a new future. It's in the local context where that future is discerned. Don't develop church programs to invite people in, but make the focus the neighborhood where God's already working ahead of us. One step we could take is answering, where are the gathering places in your neighborhood or community? The second rule is to leave your baggage at home, to humanize our relationships with others, not seeing others as objects. Set aside predetermined outcomes of what we want to happen and trust that through conversations with neighbors, we will receive their gift. Rule three is don't move from house to house. Settle into the neighborhood, whether around the church or your home. Invest, inhabit, and engage in the life outside your doorsteps. Rule four is eat what is set before you. Enter into the other's world on their terms rather than ours, in their context and environment. The fifth rule is to become poets of the ordinary. This means reflecting on the stories beneath the words we're hearing, connecting them to God's story. It's not a one-way street, in listening and conversing, we are also changed. Rule six is to move the static into the unpredictable. This means leaders need to introduce creative disruption, giving voice to the anxieties that can unlock creative energies, such as the old ways no longer work, where are the younger families, and questions like that. The seventh rule is listening people into speech. This means creating spaces within church for honest sharing of anxieties and hopes, bringing their stories to interact with God's story, and hearing the Holy Spirit speak. In learning this skill in church, we can also listen with our neighbors. Rule eight is to experiment around the edges. Instead of grand programs to fix problems, why not try small experiments to discover for ourselves how to connect with youth in our community, asking other churches with lots of youth for their insights, etc. BHAG's big, hairy, audacious goals don't last, don't change anything, and create disappointment. Anxiety lies under BHAG's and diverts attention from the neighborhood. The ninth and final rule is repeat steps one to eight over and over again wash, rinse, repeat. Real culture change in a congregation takes time, and these rules live faithfully and repeatedly can become a way of life. Luke helped disciples reorient themselves in a new space where Jerusalem wasn't the center anymore, and God was ahead of them. As we consider these rules, Here's one from our denominational history that speaks today. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. What would living this rule look like, embodied in our homes, our workplaces, our church, our neighborhoods, our social media, our society and culture, our politics, our world. 
Given our scattered families, anonymous neighborhoods, competitive workplaces, anti-social media, and partisan politics, what if in all these things we were loving? Amongst the current fragmentation, divisions, tribalism, pettiness, meanness, and partisan bickering that turns strangers, neighbors, and even friends and family into so-called enemies. How might we be a movement for wholeness that because of Christ chooses to love despite the differences that might otherwise divide us? Here's our final logbook entry. Our primary task in a stormy world is to rebuild community by entering to, nurturing, and creating spaces of belonging with neighbors, strangers, and enemies. God's timely task for our time is more than just creating camaraderie among the crew, but helping create that beyond the crew. During our Q&A, time permitting, we'll share a current example of how living room conversations are helping create that camaraderie. As part of our learning process, you'll see some questions in your logbook. We'll have a time of discussion during our ice cream social and celebration will not only engage these, but others you may have written on post-its to place during communion on the mural where we find a ship. Let's pray. Lord of history, sovereign of the seas, you form true community among mixed crowds leaving Egypt and motley crews sailing the Mediterranean with Paul. Give us faith when violent winds rush down upon us. Give us hope when tempest rage and neither sun nor stars appear. Give us ears to hear you say, do not be afraid, having granted safety to all who are sailing with us. Only by your presence, power, and purpose does true community form, whether among or beyond us. Help us join your work underway to rebuild community within our very neighborhoods. In the name of the one who walked on stormy seas, we pray. Amen. If you'd like to be part of God's